shifting from tone back to tempo, um, just thinking about it, it's it's such an epic film in scope, Roma, um, and again like like Vice and very much like um, First Man, the the shifts are quite extraordinary throughout. Um, could you talk a little bit about the conversations that you had with Alfonso about the lead up to the riot scenes? I thought you were going to ask me about my score. But <laughs> <laughs> um, the lead up to the riot scene. Um, for that, there was, it was again just building it as it kind of ran in. Uh, that first pass on it wasn't actually too difficult. Where it started getting tricky was when we were working on the rhythm with the vocals in the background. So we had these great recordings of crowds chanting. And then we would revisit that scene in the build-up where we were kind of, with those chants, we were going between them, trying to set some geography outside for the group, setting the scale. So uh, that was probably one of the more challenging elements in that build-up there. But I, for Roma anyway, I see everything kind of in movements, almost yes. like an opera. So part of this cut goes from them arriving in their car all the way up to the berth. So I see that almost as one rhythm, as, as it would be. So that the... the the cut is kind of, the shots are probably getting slower, but we're building tension using sound kind of all the way up to the to the berth. Um, and then another scene that um, I personally just am desperate to know about, and I, I don't know if there were alternate shots to this, but the scene at the beach, it is one of the most extraordinary shots for anyone who's seen the film. You're, you're watching someone watching people drown, possibly drowning. And it, it, still, it, it still makes me incredibly nervous thinking about that, of how I felt while I was watching that sequence. Um, was that a decision made right at the beginning, that is the shot we're going for, or were there multiple perspectives initially? Um, that's all they had. So that was actually an easy one to edit, because the, the day before there was a <laughs> storm... Oh, yeah, that's all they no, had. Yeah. No, the day it's before... It's a great scene. <laughs> the day, they built a pier going out into the sea that they kind of had the track on and had the camera on a crane would go out with it. And there was two days before there was a storm and it washed it away. So they had to, they were in a rush to rebuild it. And in that rush, it didn't, they didn't set it well. So it kept, the camera kept derailing. So we have one complete shot. So no, that was, that, yeah, that was kind of easy. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I comped the birds in at the beginning because <laughs> we did have another shot that, you know, a few that did start, there's none that made it to the end. So you mean there was just one take? Yeah. That's <sighs> That was an easy day at the office. <laughs> Just cut off the slates, comp in the birds, and you're done. Job done. Okay, Adam. We're going to erase that part of the tape. Oh, yeah. We're going to go back, and you're going to give us a really complex reason for how this happened. We're all going to think, how brilliant that is. It's all CG. <laughs> um, I, everyone's seen footage of a lunar landing, um, and yet it, it, to, to still have that thrill in a fiction film a recreation of that. Um, again, the, the, the same people were talking earlier about the lengths they went to to, to, to get that right sound. But once all those um, shots uh, have been put together, it is an extraordinary sequence. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the challenge of actually putting all that together? Well, the, I think the big challenge in general for that, for the whole movie, uh, really, was how can we show the audience things that they haven't seen before. You know, how can we offer something dramatic? Can we offer something emotional um, that uh, the audience is going to feel in, that they can invest in and that they haven't seen before? Um, because I think the, the thing that we knew we would have to fight is the iconography, you know, or, or we'd have to work with it, but we could not merely just offer up Neil Armstrong, the icon. We had to offer some of his humanity. We had to offer um, very personal and intimate things that, that people are normally not privy to. So I think for the moon, that was, that was one of the biggest ingredients is to, um, is to find a way to show things that, that people hadn't seen before. And so people, you know, I mean, most people know images or footage of Neil Armstrong climbing down the ladder and make, taking his first step. And we knew that we would have to show that because we owed that to the story. But, you know, a big part of it was, okay, now can we go off on this other moment um, and spend time with Neil Armstrong alone, where, uh, which really, really did happen. There's some speculation as to did he really do this thing that he did on the moon? 
Um, we don't know. That's kind of speculation. Um, but we do know that he did spend a certain amount of time alone standing at a crater where he was off radio comms and where he was away from Buzz Aldrin. And though that was a moment that, that Damien and the screenwriter Josh Singer really wanted to dig into because then they felt like if, if we could um, somehow let the audience get into Neil Armstrong's head a little bit, or, or at least to show this private moment that they might begin to have an idea of what he might have been feeling, which um, I think was something really important to Damien. So, um, so we, we, you know, we leaned into the subjective um, storytelling and what made that easier was uh, was the IMAX photography. So, you know, we had kind of set up this thing, this first person um, kind of style earlier, and just right from the beginning in the X15. But certainly, we carried that forward in the Gemini 8 sequence, where uh, we leaned heavily on these point of view subjective shots, where you would see things through Neil Armstrong's eyes. He's approaching the Gemini capsule um, in IMAX. We could, you know, the, the the resolution of the image kind of allowed us to kind of hold on those shots and slow down and and invest in them more because you could really um, there was more to look at in in the picture. You know, you could really focus on the grain, the fine grain of of the soil, and you could, you know, you could you could hold on that shot of the gloves climbing down the rungs of the ladder because you could really see the stitches in the gloves. And it, it just kind of invited us to hold things longer. And so in that way, we could kind of double down on this subjective you are there um, style where, you know, hopefully the audience is feeling like it's their, you know, it's their step that they're taking on the moon. And once you kind of get into that headspace, um, our hope was that we could kind of pivot to this more emotional thing where we start having these flashbacks um, and he starts seeing images of his family. And all of that, by the way, is, is, uh, is not really in the script. That's stuff that's culled from uh, this 16 millimeter verite footage, uh, rehearsal footage. Um, and that's just something we played around with in the editing room. I think this is something that, that all three films that are so different have in common is they each take on an incredibly large issue, whether it's a geopolitical situation in Mexico uh, in the early 1970s, the la lunar landing, and as, um, as Christian Bale alluded to, the Antichrist. Um, the, and yet they, they, all three films drill down and end up being incredibly intimate and, and deeply personal. Um, Hank, I just, I just want to ask you, but the thing that... The, in many ways personalizes the, the, the story of Dick Cheney is the humor that comes out of a film. And I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but there are a number of elements, a, an interesting appearance of film credits, reference to Shakespeare, and we find out who someone is quite late in the film where we didn't even realize it. Um, knowing that certain things were cut out, people have talked about the, the locker room scene with uh, Christian Bell with his shirt off. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, were, were those things that just, just worked straight away and you knew that you, you had them? Because they come out as quite big surprises throughout the film. Well, the, um, the, the credit sequence was, was actually very well planned out. Uh, the locker sequence, locker room, yes. the, is... It, it was also very well planned out. Uh, there wasn't much room there for spontaneity. Adam had Adam had actually thought this stuff out, um, but there was there was a real balance between the seriousness of it and the um, and the comedy. Adam Adam comes from an improv world, you know, so he'll shoot many many takes just. Having having his actors uh, go in many different places, so it became a very subjective thing. You know, how, what is funny, what is not funny, uh, and uh, well, that's 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 pretty much it. Um, if you haven't seen Vice, it's still showing in cinemas. Um, I know Roma is available on Netflix, but there are two or three cinemas still showing it in London. Do not watch it on streaming first. Watch it in the cinema. 70 mil at Prince Charles. 
There we go. And you can see First Man now. It's, it's been released on DVD and Blu-ray. Thank you very much to BAFTA for organising this event. But most of all, can you please join me in thanking our guests today? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.